Cool. Ah, here we go, right. So we got that. Yep. Happy. Um, yeah, so I am an electronics design engineer. Uh, I have been through some of the life through training. I did the C CLAD, I think, maybe four years ago, but haven't really don't really have any formal use for LabVIEW um, and so I've recently done this kind of little project to automate some um, analog front end testing. Um, it was to help out a colleague on, on the project that we we're working on which is now called Solstice, used to be called CubeMap. Um, it was an ESA project for um, Earth observation and uh, the ESA mission got cancelled, but we've we've continued the development of the instruments for um, picking up grants from the UK Space Agency and CEOI, which is the kind of uh, centre for Earth observation instrumentation, maybe. Um, so yeah, that's the the, the instrument development work is still ongoing, and this analog front end electronics seems to be the most complex one. Um, and so yeah, um, I was going to talk about kind of the motivation for doing this, uh, what the test looks like. Um, then I was going to look at the VIs and, and walk through that. Um, some pros and cons that I've come up with and then a couple of ideas for improvements that I've had and hopefully if uh, if anyone with more LabVIEW experience or different ideas uh, can, can give me hints of where to get better, um, that'd be great. Uh, so yeah, the motivation I kind of mentioned We've had this um, ongoing development work for for um, for the CubeMap uh, Solstice project. I've put in a link to a YouTube video where the um, chief investigator, the chief scientist for the project, uh, gave a talk at the Appleton Space Conference last year about CubeMap, and it's there if anyone's interested in in the background of the project. Um, <clears throat> Fundamentally, we were having some bandwidth issues with, with the initial design of the analog front end, and uh, my colleague basically needed a way to quickly establish what, what the bandwidth of his designs were and what evaluation boards, and basically part of the research and development process. Um, so, yeah, to manually produce a magnitude versus frequency plot for a device it took about 20 minutes but ish. Um, and so automating it basically was, was valuable from a time and um, money perspective. Um, so it's quite a simple test. You have a function generator plugged into your unit under test uh, and then an oscilloscope that captures both the input and the output to the unit under test, set a frequency, measure the amplitude of the output and the input, divide the two and you get a gain for that given frequency. And then you do that for lots of different frequencies. Um, so quite a simple process. So it should be quite easy to, to automate. Um, I've listed the devices that I use, uh, function generator and oscilloscope. Um, no particular reason for picking them other than we had them in the lab. <laughs> um, although we bought the, the second function generator because um, we were finding 250 megahertz was the first one wasn't quite high enough to see everything that we wanted. Um, so the second one goes is an RF signal generator, so it goes doesn't do the low frequency stuff, but it can go up to one and a half gigahertz. Um, and the scope is good for up to a gigahertz. So um, our bandwidth, I think our cutoff is 150 megahertz, but some of the evaluation boards could go higher. So it was nice to see what what it does at higher frequencies. Um, yeah, so I guess that's unless there's any questions about the overview, but um, I was thinking now is a good time to kind of dive into what the um, what it looks like. Uh, so that's just the, the project. There's not much to it. Um, and let's see I can check this over. Now this is where I might change. So we are back to seeing. Uh, I've just admitted. 
Um, sorry, uh, I saw there was someone on on the in the lobby oh, please waiting. Do, yeah, I've been trying to put my phone away. But... Yeah, <laughs> and he's just left. Um, yes, so the project is fairly small. Uh, the top level, so I've got two top levels. One when I for for the different function generators. Um, that just seems the quickest way to to do what I needed to do. I don't I don't know whether there's a, an easier way to make it so you can pick which function generator to use, etc., and then use the different VIs behind it. So front panel is fairly simple. You you kind of go uh, you find your resource. Um, so at the moment I'm not plugged into anything, so I'm not seeing much. Um, so this is the default IP addresses, so that they're, they're connected to the network. Um, you select what your frequency test frequencies will be. So I've got this. You can either go give me a start frequency, stop frequency, and the points per decade, uh, and it will calculate a set of test frequencies, or you can give it a um, a text file input, and it will read. Um, from that list and test at those frequencies. Um, yeah. Uh, and then the only kind of front panel controls that we've got is um, to set the amplitude of the um, function generator output and how many waveforms to average for each um, measurement. Uh, that's, so that's the scope setting, and then the amplitude is for the function generator. Um, and then as it cycles through, you'll see, I think I've got this picture here, which shows you what it looks like after. So yeah, this is the test setup. I ran it this morning and it seems to still work. So we've got the oscilloscope and the, the RF signal generator, and then the, the lab view on screen, you can see uh, I've got a screenshot here. So this is once it's run, you'll have uh, your waveforms from so your oscilloscope uh, shot essentially, uh, and then once it's finished running the test, it will output the Bode plot here, um, and you can kind of. Well, at the moment we just use it as export, right-click, export to Excel, and that's about that's about as complicated as the login gets. Um, but yeah, so it's a nice vision. Yeah, we've got the the graphs there to show you that it's kind of working and it matches what you're seeing on on the scope. Um, I don't invite well we've never used that as a remote test thing so you've always got the scope in front of you and, and things like that um yeah so getting into the block diagrams i think i may have used uh, the new feature of zooming which i didn't know was a thing until <laughs> recently um but yeah so to start with uh you kind of generate the test frequencies so um depending on what tab control which tab you've got set it will either generate use this function to generate some test frequencies which i can't remember where i got it i think i had that from a previous thing um but it's uh yeah generate uh, equally spaced or logarithmically spaced um numbers for for the start and stop range um uh, let's see, that will just output an array, um, so you can kind of use that to produce some numbers if you want. Um, or you read a text file, um, so when the user inputs a text file, I've got all the debug stuff out because I didn't really know how that worked, and then it started working, so I haven't cleaned it up. Um, yeah, so it basically needs a very simple text file where You've got a number down one column. Let's see, let's see if I've got one of them. Uh, text file looks like that, and that's what I can read. Um, it it's not very robust, so if you feed it something different, I don't know what will happen. But uh, it kind of it did the job. Um, so yeah, we can see what that. That'll give us a little run. Okay, fine. That's a very short file, and it gives that to the to the top VI. So you've got our test frequencies, and then um, with the Tektronix uh, devices, uh, they use their kind of plug and play um, LabVIEW library, and found that um, 
I had to pull out the initialize communication link outside of the main loop um, because it was crashing a lot because it was very slow to initialize the link and then do the measurement and then close the link and keep doing that over and over again. And I found some time out. Whereas, um, whereas the TTI um, function generator didn't have a plug and play thing. It had an IVI com library. So I found this was this was working with just uh, the initialize and close inside the loop. Um, and so I didn't think too much about that. Um, but yes, uh, we'll go run run through the main functionality first. So you in, initialize the link with the with the oscilloscope, and then for your te so this um, for loop is kind of driven off the test frequencies uh, array. Um, for your first te test frequency, you write that to the function generator, um, and. Uh, using the amplitude so that the RF signal generator works in dBm rather than volts, so that's a, a conversion um, to feed into the VI that I've made for controlling function generator. Set the frequency, I've got this kind of weight in there that's mainly to, to let the analog signal settle, so um, yeah, so just to avoid kind of doing any measurements on any transient behavior and then um, run the um, Tektronics, kind of a modified version of the Tektronics uh, read scope signals. Um, and then once I've got that, I've got some waveforms out and I use the um, NI, NI library um, to, to give me an amplitude output for the output channel and the input channel. Um, and then that's my that's my gain for that given frequency. Store that in a in an array, and then basically do that until I'm out of test frequencies, and then plot the um, make the bode plot from that. Um, you'll see there's various kind of hard coded settings around here. Um, these are kind of uh, added in to ensure that the scope channels don't saturate for a given um, input amplitude. So it takes the input amplitude and says make your input channel range four times bigger than the amplitude. And then depending on the gain of your unit under test, you want to kind of make the output range a, a number higher than a multiple higher than the input range. Um, so you don't see clipping and you don't mess your measurement up. But that's all very kind of manual and this works for our projects and that's where we are. Um, I've added this kind of number of periods and sampling multiplier so that that's aimed at um, setting what, uh, how long the scope requires for and the sampling rate of the oscilloscope. So those, those are all settings that you can um, change from the lab view um, kind of, well, the oscilloscope has lots of lots and lots of settings. Um, it was, a, it was a case of playing around until we found what worked for us. Um, yeah, so typically with a frequency response, it'd be quite nice to get a phase um, phase measurement out. That wasn't so, didn't seem so critical for our application, so I didn't worry about that too much. And it's just a gain versus frequency rather than having a phase versus frequency plot as well. Um, I would guess you'd, um, well, if I had to implement something like that, it'd probably be along the same lines of finding a library to to get a kind of relative phase between the output and input um, for each frequency and just adding it in at the end of this step. Um, yeah, so I think if we go into, well, this is just straight out of the, um, the Tektronics example library, so it's not much, I don't really know how that works. It initializes the com link with, with the scope. Um, the fun, I flashed this up earlier. Um, I've never used IVI com, seems quite easy actually. Yeah, I was, it was daunting to start with um, because I was used to having the Tektronics library where they give you a VI and you, you can just pick, you know, run it, run it, run it as an example. Um, but the, the function gen, RF signal generator didn't have such an example, but I found a quite handy guide on how to do that. Um, and 
feels feels better than the plug-in play VIs because it, I don't know, it seems to run more smoothly and I'm in more control of. I feel like I know what's going on behind the scenes rather than the plug-and-play VI, which um, is doing lots of things I didn't really take the time to understand. Um, I think the, the only clever thing I do in here is um, I didn't find a way to set the RF output to be enabled, so enable the output channel. Um, so instead, I found this read back whether the RF output is enabled and then um, tell the user or throw an error um, if the RF output's disabled because if there's no signal going into the unit under test, then your test is pointless. So don't carry on. Um, yeah. Um, so they would have to turn that on on the instrument first. Yeah. So so I don't know if I've got I haven't really got a photo on it, but you um you kind of have to press output enable before you try and remotely set the frequency and the power level. Um, so yeah, this kind of prompt, I think my error message kind of tells them to do that. Stupid question. Yeah. That the property you're reading, that's not yeah. a read and write property. Uh, I don't think it is, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, can't remember what. Yeah, some of them will tell you you can change it to a write, but it will be yeah. an error if it's not actually. Yeah, change. so if I change, change to write, uh, I can't remember what. Um, uh, so you, you might be able to just toggle that on via software. Yeah. Some TTI instruments have. You need to access this setting via the button. Yeah, I think, I think I did look around for a little bit and thought that this way was easier than trying yeah. to battle <laughs> with. If, if it was a tool pass. Anyway, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, well that then feeds the front panel, which my Tektronix one didn't have is this indicator to show you that the function generator's on, um, which was a nice little addition there. Um, and then the read channels, this is kind of shoehorning what I wanted to do into the lab view example. Um, so this one, because it doesn't have an initialize and close in it, you can't just run it on its own. Um, but the example I took did, and you could just run and capture one waveform and then move on. So that's where I started um, and then added in a bunch of other kind of um, settings that we needed. Um, as I said before, there's lots and lots of settings on an oscilloscope, um, all of which can kind of make make your make your signal look weird if you if you've got it wrong. Um, yeah, there's stuff like trigger trigger coupling, edges, level, acquisition types are different. But um, yeah, block diagram kind of, it's not the most pretty. Um, but so it, it is kind of hard coded from this VI, which which oscilloscope channel is your output and which oscilloscope channel is your input. And so it would require the user to go in here and say, I've plugged the output into channel three. Um, and then kind of save that and then run the top level to get your bone plotting right. Um, that's one of my uh, improvements that I'd like to pull out maybe all of these settings and have it in a in a com configuration file essentially, because with so many buried settings in this VI, it makes it hard to run the same test again, knowing exactly what your settings were and um, things like that. And so it's led to a little bit of confusion, but not enough for me to <laughs> have to um, change this. But I think if if more people start using it, it's, <laughs> or we start using it for more formalized tests, it, it would help to have. There are VIs that have been taken apart from now. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh. That would be a very quick way. Oh, nice. Um, Cool. Um, do you know what it is? I'm not sure I've not used it. Okay. Cool. I think you block off and it just finds every control and then just press the file. Give it a file, will find the name to match up to all the names. 
Yeah, you need to make that. Cool. There you go, that's one of my improvements that, <laughs> uh, that I have. Um, I'm not sure what else there is to say really. It's all quite, um, it's basically everything that you can do with an oscilloscope you can do through the lab view. Um, so we've got uh, configure acquisition digitizer. So this is where I write the sample rates and um, that goes from this sampling multiplier um, control that showed earlier, or I spoke about earlier, um, and for how long to sample. Um, we've got then configure acquisition. Uh, this is where you either average or sample and uh, how many averages, um, etc. Then configure each channel in turn. So that's giving it a channel name and your the range that I was speaking about earlier. So your input channel has your um, vertical range one is your input channel range, and then vertical range two is your output channel range. Um, so yeah, I don't think I think this is as low as I got in terms of um, messing with the Tektronix uh, plug and play um, VIs. Uh, configure time base. Um, that's to do with triggering. Um, I think I oh know no time base. Uh, I think that's just hard coded. At one point, I may have thought that was. That was uh, something we needed. Um, actually, that's right. When you're watching the scope go, uh, the time base doesn't change. Um, so I don't know where that on that photo that I had up. Um, yeah, where is it? Oh no! Ah uh, no! Sorry. Oh god. Um. Ah, for all the different frequencies, basically, it'd be nice if the scope would change the time base, which is maybe where that, that setting is. Um, so maybe I can use that control. Um, configure the, the trigger, and then this is the um, read multiple waveforms um, uh, VI, which I think does the most of the work. So once you've configured everything, that sort of reads out your data. Um, and then there's kind of some the, the inbuilt error handling and things from those VIs um, that just feed through. I have noticed that it it seems to struggle when you give it kind of tens of hertz as a time. I think the acquisition might take too long, and then there's some timeouts that I've not quite um, worked out why. Um, but my colleague did say that he, was, he kind of did some sweeps at lower frequencies, and it kept giving him errors. So. I kind of told him to stop wor worrying about the lower frequencies <laughs> uh, rather than try and fix the error. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's it. Um, the Tektronix uh, function generator works is quite simple. The function generator is much more simple than um, oscilloscopes in the way that I'm using them, uh, which is essentially set a sine wave. Um, so that's the block diagram for the uh, I don't think I, well, I, I think I just took out the initialize and the close from the, the main example of set sine wave. Um, and so that's again, just kind of configure waveform and then enable it. Um, so yeah, there's not much really to be said about uh, the Tektronix example versus the TTI one. Um, TTI was more interesting for me to set up um, or more involved for me to set up than the Tektronix one. Um, yeah, I think that's all of my VIs in a whistle stop way. Um, don't know if there's any other questions before I move back to the presentation on the VIs while I'm there. I know. Cool. Um, So yeah, I kind of touched on them as I was going. The main pro that we have is that it works and um, we've been able to kind of have these kind of bode plots or magnitude versus frequency plots generated in, in a couple of minutes. 
by just pressing a button rather than having to set the function generator, see what magnitudes are our input for each frequency. Um, yeah, I've put tens of hours, I don't really know how many um, how many plots my colleagues done um, to tell you kind of more accurately, um, but we've been using it for, for a fair while and it seems to work with some minor issues that I've kind of alluded to. Um, and as, as I kind of showed when we got the new um, function generator, you, you can kind of adapt it to change what equipment you've got. Um, the cons I've got is very specific to our testing. I think in the way that it's been built up is to aid our development for our project specifically. So there was no real, I say, incentive or time for me to make it more generic and make it um, easier. There are lots of settings hard coded. Um, can't really reuse it unless someone's willing to, or share it unless someone's willing to dig into block diagrams and change uh, various things. Um, I mentioned the settings buried in the VIs, so I think we've got potentially a solution there for making make an easy way to make that uh, kind of save those configurations and make it easy to repeat again. Um, doesn't include the phase measurement that you typically get with a frequency response analysis. Um, and then they're crashing when we're testing low frequencies. It's not a problem for us. I think our um, front end bandwidth is something like 10 to 150 megahertz. So we don't, it's not, it doesn't take very long to take four sine waves of 10 megahertz. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my pros and cons. Ideas for improvements could go off that. So. <clears throat> I think in an ideal world, I'd be able to kind of release an exit and, and let you prompt, uh, hey, connect to your scope, make sure it works, connect to your function generator, make sure it works, um, load load settings or or a slightly nicer way to input the, the settings and then something that formalizes the results file and, and maybe saves the settings with the, or timestamps the settings with the, with the um, results file. Um, I think I saw some of the Tektronix has IVI com libraries um, and now I'm not so scared by that. I might, uh, it might be nice to um, kind of try and replace the, the plug and play VIs with those. Um, it seems to be more efficient from what I've seen. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, whether I just got lucky. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know if there's any from the room. That's, that's basically the end of my presentation. and. Um, yeah, onto the questions or ideas, be much appreciated. I think the, the com libraries, some obviously more than this, is probably in the plug and play drivers a layer that's more similar to the com right. stuff. So quite often there'll be like a base layer API, and then there's, you know, like they try and put all the easy functions on top. Yeah. So you might be able to find a similar level in those libraries which might be a bit easier to work with than that view. I'm, yeah. I'm impressed you've got you've done well with the, the com stuff because sometimes it can be yeah uh, lab is better than other things I've tried to do comming but <laughs> yeah uh, it can be a bit a bit tricky sometimes but yeah I don't know but obviously that's very driver specific so I don't know yes electronics ones. yeah but it might be worth having a look to see if you can pull out some of the lower level stuff yeah um I'm gonna write down do you do you remember the library that you mentioned, or, or uh, uh, well, I don't actually use that. MDI. MDI. MGI. MGI. So they have like a big set of like utilities on the um, package network. They have a lot of things like that. Basically, there's a, a property of a PI where you say, give me all the controls on the front end. Yeah. References. And by references, you say, what's the name of this control? Yeah. What's its value? And you can store it. Store it. Save yeah, it. yeah, yeah. And that's, they package that, but they can also go through tab controls. Okay. So, you know, I'm guessing you could also then use the reverse. Yeah, and then you do the reverse. Just, I mean, mm. Here's my file or information. I'll use JSON. 
Okay. Go through all the control. What's the name? Is there a corresponding thing? Take the value and set it to the control. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Anything else? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it depends on the sort of way you want to take this idea. Yeah. So some of the things that I have, some of the lurking that I might want to do. Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, you see someone's code, it's like, well, why? Like, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's sort of like to start with it, so trying to implement maybe like a state machine type of structure around it. Yeah. Because that will give you a lot more flexibility when it comes to things like configuration. Yeah. Uh, Saving data, yeah, and yeah. post analysis, things like that, mm. and it allows you to split up your code a little bit more. Yeah, uh, and I had the same idea when you said you had the IV comps where you could you could initialize and close at the same time. It didn't cause you issues. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy that's that's the case for you. And, yeah, uh, but you could do the same as what you've done with the scope, where you could take those property nodes and just move them outside. Just yeah, just limit. Uh, Amount of processing you'd have to do. Yes. Before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and just pass the reference like you've done, which is good. Uh, and sort of the last sort of idea you mentioned you were you were looking to move to a new uh, function generator. Mm. Uh, maybe something like a hardware abstraction there if you want to deploy this further in, like, let's say, one well, build an executable. Mm. So having sort of a know how familiar you are with that. Basically, the application can work with both sets of function generators, depending on either like a configuration before you start or looking at what's available and then selecting the, the instance it needs. Yeah. Which is it's, it's quite a it's a fun challenge to make in yeah. um, sort of learning from so, yeah, those were sort of my two sort of nice nice things to have. But yeah, yeah. It, it looks good and uh, it seems to be doing what you need to do at the moment. Yeah, I think that's work. that's my. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's the big pro. Yeah, it, it does what you need to do. So anything yes. here is like nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um. Great. That's other room can quiet. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I wanted to talk about TDMS again, which I realised as I've gone through about my old presentation looking for tears. I've talked about this quite a lot. Um, but it's something I'm quite find quite interesting in that I actually it's a really nice bit of technology in the NI ecosystem. Um, the, the in 2023 bit is basically a you know a bit of background to this is you know as I spoke to a few of you, I'm doing more and more stuff in Rust as well and there isn't a TDMS library in Rust well there wasn't <laughs> uh, so I kind of came back to it so okay well what what do I get from TDMS do I still want to be able to support that do I still need to support that and what else is out there because um, you know I've not really thought about it in great detail frankly for several years um, so just coming back and revisiting that decision I thought it might make for an interesting topic really to um, 
just put some of the thoughts out over that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how it works, not in great detail, it was the plan, um, and then look at some kind of alternatives and kind of where it sits against those. Um, but I'm pretty free, if you want to ask one more question to start, we'll, we'll go with it. <laughs> um, so how many people have heard of TDMS? Most people. And how many people have used it? It's still nearly most people. <laughs> um, so okay, so T TDMS fundamentally is a data format for um, measurement data, engineering data, uh, to be stored in a file. And what makes it somewhat, it has two main features, which tend to, well, I guess this is getting to the end at the beginning, two main features that, that tend to make it really good for that. The first is internally, it stores data in a binary format, and you can generally, although there's a few pitfalls, um, it's very fast to read and write data. Um, the second is it has this kind of hierarchy concept built into its internal data model. So down at the bottom here is actually our measurement channels. Um, but then these can be um, grouped into groups. <laughs> and at each level of this, we can apply and say metadata. Um, so like with a bug plotter, if you needed to log all the data, those settings could end up in the metadata. So you, you can reload that and say, uh, see how it was captured and what it was captured with. Uh, so for example, something as simple as I'll often put the software version in the, the file level properties so that I, ah uh, yeah, no, that wasn't a good version, okay. <laughs> um, so that's the basic gist of it. It's an NI format, NI developed it. It's not really used widely outside of the NI ecosystem possibly at all. Um, but it is technically an open format, so they have published how it works. Um, I've been trying to build a Rust library from that, and it's got a few gaps, but it's 80% there, um, so you can build something yourself. Uh, but in reality, it's fairly well supported, actually, across kind of engineering platforms, so obviously LabVIEW. Um, there's a C library that, that NI release as well. Um, to talk to it, there is a Python library, which I believe is open source. I don't think it's it's, it's tied into NI in any way. So, uh, and there's a MATLAB library, which I think, again, I don't think NI produced it. I think someone's produced it and wrapped their kind of C library to make that work. Um, so it's actually pretty versatile. You can get data certainly out of this in a lot of different environments. Um, writing is a bit more complicated sometimes. Um, and this is its trick. So this kind of started, and I don't know the exact history, but there was a format, and there still is, but I've never seen anyone use it, called TDM, which is Technical Data Management. Um, I think it might have been one that NI bought in. I don't know if it came from DDM, or it was tightly related to how DDM basically stored its data with this hierarchy. But you couldn't stream to it. You had to write the whole file in one go. Um, which for a lot of data acquisition applications is, is no good. You know, you want to be streaming data in over a longer period. So what TDMS does internally is it breaks the files into segments. And essentially you can just keep adding segments to the file. That's the streaming bit. And then each segment has a header, which says what it contains, some metadata, which tells you what channels are there or if there's any properties to be stored. And then the raw data at the end is stored as just binary data. Um, and that's where the performance comes in. As long as you're just writing the raw data segments again and again, it does a load of optimizations to get that really close to essentially the performance of your hard drive. Um, so it's very fast and very efficient. But as I say, it's not used elsewhere very much. So I kind of went looking and I've been thinking about the different formats. This is slightly biased in kind of the triggering for this is I've been speaking with a few more people in like the data science world who, you know, kind of operate in Python a lot with data frame libraries. And they were the ones that kind of put me onto a few of these as well and got me thinking about, okay, what do they have that we need? Because they have a very similar problem in having quite a lot of detailed data to store and manage. Um, albeit their emphasis is a lot, often a lot more on read performance, which I'll come back to. 
Um, and that's an important thing with any kind of data storage. There is trade-offs for read performance and trade-offs for write performance, and very often they might be in conflict. Um, and so we'll see that with a couple of the formats, because that's a decision that you have to make when you're kind of choosing some of these. So that, that's basically all the explanation I have of TDMS. Is that enough for everybody, or are there any questions? Or So the first one that always comes up is the data format that will never die, which is CSV files, um, or comma, comma separated values. I keep, always forget what the V actually is intended for. Um, the basic idea behind this is you have a, a table format. So you can store a single table, if you like, in a file. Um, there's no definition of what this looks like. It's You could mix types wherever you want. The main the important thing to be aware of is it's all text underneath. So that makes it super versatile. Anything that deals with data will probably be able to load or save out CSV files. But it is very ill-defined as to how you store data. <laughs> um, so like an obvious problem as well with numeric values, you have to decide how many decimal points you save. Um, you have to kind of trade off size versus resolution um, when you're writing it. Um, you can sort of put metadata at the top, but there's no definition of that in the file format. So whatever reader you're going to use has to understand what that data is going to look like. Um, I mean, most things will probably assume that you have a channel name at the top. But that's probably as far as they'll go normally. Um, and timestamps. I hate timestamps CSV. Um, I did, and I, I was trying to remember this morning, whether I wrote this up on, on a blog or not, I spent a good couple of hours just playing with different ways you can put time into a CSV and how Excel will display that. Because that's what so many people are doing. You take the CSV file, load it into Excel, and then I'll go, the times all look weird. Because Excel is trying to make sense of times. And it's. If you know that Excel doesn't understand the actual defined default time format. Yeah, it, it, it's, I mean, Underneath, I love so much of Excel. I mean, Excel, the thing, the conclusion I basically came to is you have to store the date and the time separately. Excel understands dates and it understands time. It doesn't understand the two together. <laughs> um, I think that was the main conclusion I came to. But wherever possible, I'll just do a relevant time step now. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's always going to be around. It's going to work everywhere. But that text-based format means it's, it can be difficult to be precise. Um, it's also quite, it's going to be less efficient for writing, you know, you're not going to get the same kind of throughput um, because you've got to convert everything to text first. Um, I'll come back to it a bit, let's just go. So this was a new one for me, and I've never heard this referenced in the NI ecosystem um, much, and that's called Parquet or Apache Parquet. Um, this is really heavily used in the data science ecosystem. This was kind of what triggered a lot of thinking around this. What does this look like? So this is a an open format defined, or just part of the Apache Software Foundation now. I don't know quite what the history is behind it. Um, and this literally came from I was chatting to a guy and I was talking about one project. It's like, yeah, we've got you know all this IoT data basically that we've got to archive for years. So you should look at Parquet files. So that's what they do. He said, for example, in banks a lot, you know, after transactions get to a certain age, they'll put them into Parquet files into an archive. Um, and they're common enough that a lot of storage formats understand them. So if you're working with cloud storage like S3 on AWS, you can actually query directly into Parquet files without having to actually load the whole file into your software and, and do that. So it's really well supported. And, you know, if you've got people doing data analysis with stuff like pandas in Python, it'll know how to load these and work with these. So it was kind of interesting, and I, I wanted to dig deeper into it. Um, basically, it's the same data structure as a CSV file, in that you're storing a table in a file, as far as I can understand. Um, so it doesn't really solve the metadata problem. But what it does solve is a couple of things over CSV. The, the first is everything is stored in a binary format and the types are defined. So you've got um, more precision and more performance than you'd have with CSV. The other is 
it's optimized for what's called column layout. So what that means is CSV, you write it in row by row. And so you end up with something like this. So if you've got column A, B, C, and row 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you write the whole of row 1, then the whole of row 2, the whole of row 3. And if you're streaming into a file, that's the way data's coming at you, basically. Um, so it's, it tends to be the way things are written. When it comes to doing analytics on that file, quite often uh, what you're going to be want to do is pull out a column at a time. And what that means for this format is you have to kind of skip through the file, you know, without getting too much into the nitty gritty of, of, of all the underlying stuff. It probably means effectively you're reading the whole file from disk. Um, you might be able to jump depending on sizes, but um, you're doing a lot more work. And the first rule of optimization is just do less work in the first place. So what Parquet files do is they build it into a column layout. So instead of storing every row together, it stores every column together. And it, it kind of blocks them so you can still sort of stream into it a bit like the TDMS files. Um, what that means is a couple of things. The first is pulling out the column is much faster because you're just saying, right, you know, in this one we have to read the whole file. In this one we might just need to read the first five elements to get column A. Um, it also means, and this is the interesting bit from a TDMS standpoint that we don't have, is you can do some interesting like encoding and compression on these. So if you want to archive these for a long time, if you imagine you've got temperature data, that's probably the easiest example, it doesn't change by very much on every measurement. So there are some more interesting compression techniques you can do like that. So um, a lot of time series databases take advantage of this. Time series data tends to compress really well if you can compress like a single channel as a, as a, as a run. Um, so that's kind of a new one for me if you like this time around. I still think, though, you know, having gone through this for measurement data, that metadata bit is so useful, <laughs> and this doesn't help with that. So I'm kind of intrigued. Oh, yeah. You can um, say yes. this data with Parquet, but it doesn't seem like the libraries have implemented it agree very much. Oh, OK. Because <laughs> I thought I'd heard something about it at some point, and then I went looking again, and it seems to be not core parts, but maybe yeah. that's it. Ah, OK. Yes, so Try it with one library and another. They don't agree on it. They agree with all the data stuff, but they haven't implemented the metadata bit properly. Uh, that's interesting. Oh, I need to dig deeper into that. Then. Yeah. yeah. If you if you write a Parquet file with pandas, it stores like all the pandas data types in the metadata. So when you if you reload it again, it does all the data type. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. It's for so you, nice which is confusing if you don't understand where that's coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. I'll have to dig into that a bit more then, yeah. I guess the other big side is, let's say, I haven't come across it in an ecosystem, so that isn't a library library that I could find. Um, you'd be wrapping the Python node or something like that uh, to deal with all of this as well. Um, but yeah, one... So I don't know if this is a... I've not come across it before because it's a new thing, or it's just because I've not talked to data scientists enough. I don't know how long it's been around uh, or useful, and I wonder if it will come up more in the future. Um, as these things kind of come around. The other one that always comes up in this discussion, should be a way to mute that, um, is HDF5. How many people here have worked with HDF5 out of interest? Little bits. Yeah, it, it seems like such a fit, and yet it doesn't come up as often as I think it would. I have some theories on why that might be. Um, but it's definitely worth a mention here because this is almost the closest thing to TDMS I've seen outside of TDMS. So the idea behind this is almost the same thing as TDMS. You have a file, you have some, some data sets, and you can put them into groups and you can tag metadata, you know, just like um, TDMS. It's actually a lot more sophisticated than TDMS. So as TDMS kind of forces the, the hierarchy to, to three levels and kind of what that structure looks like. HDF5, you can configure anything that you want in there, basically. Um, and I think that's one of the things. It's very powerful, and everything I read there for me says it's very complicated to work with and get the most out of it. Um, 
but it's it's yeah very sophisticated and it can do a lot more than TDMS. The big limitation I've had with TDMS um, is um, what I call higher dimensional data, so storing spectrum, storing images, um, video effectively is images. Now, TDMS doesn't do that very well. It doesn't kind of understand. So it, everything is a 1D channel basically, and there are routes you can go to kind of lay your own ideas on top of it to make that work. But HDF5 has the idea of multi-dimensional data. So I think that's where I would definitely start looking to reach this a bit more in the future is if I've got, okay, I've got my measurement data and I've got images or I've got spectral data that I need to store as well. Um, I was hoping, um, I, I know um, the guys at Precision Acoustics use it for that reason. I think they start on TDMS and went, went to this. The other big downside I found, not big downside, it doesn't naturally have a streaming interface. So it's a bit more designed as kind of an archive, archival things maybe the wrong phrase, but um, a bit like the original TDM format, you just push everything in. But there are ways to do it. So there are ways to say, oh, this space is expandable. And um, But again, this is where the complexity comes in. <laughs> it's not kind of its natural way or immediate way of being used, so you have to kind of understand how to do that. Um, it's much easier to use if you can say, right, I'm going to have 10,000 elements, set aside a space for that, and I'll, I'll fill it up. Um, but yeah, it's, it's one I really need to sit down and actually try and real application in. I've never used it for a real application, um, and it does have some nice features. Again, it's very widely supported across engineering platforms, um, you know, probably not quite as much as CSV, but <laughs> um, you know, uh, MATLAB, Python, things like that are all going to support this pretty well. There is at least one LabVIEW library for using this. I think there used to be more, um, but they seem to have fallen by the wayside a bit. Um, and they all basically wrap one C implementation. <laughs> Again, I was kind of looking for what's the downside. I found a lot of forums basically say it's too complicated that <laughs> no one can face rewriting it again. So there's like one implementation everyone uses and just accept its quirks, basically. Um, so yeah, that, that's um, one that, that I need to look at, at a bit more. Um, and I think for me, it's that multi-dimensional thing. If it's just 1D data, I'm kind of happy with TDMS because of this, it's just so much simpler to work with. Um, but if you deal with, with big multi-dimensional data sets, yeah, I can, can see this would be more appealing. Um, so speaking of, I guess, getting more complex, maybe, in, in a sense. Um, the other one I have actually used is SQLite. Um, so James here has uh, very kindly built a very nice library for allows you to work with, with SQLite. And if you haven't come across it, SQLite is a database in a file, basically. So it's kind of a relational database concepts, but you can put stuff in a file. And when I mentioned earlier about kind of coming across problems with TDMS with spectral data, this is where I went next in that project. So in that project, I store it all into a, a SQLite file. I just give it a different extension. Um, the big downside is going to be performance. You know, compared to actually streaming binary data to disk, putting it through a database layer is not going to be as fast. But in that case, if the spectral data is coming in once a second or something like that, it's more than ample. And it's definitely not slow. <laughs> I know you, James, did a demo a couple of years ago now where you were actually writing in is that right? Am I remembering that right? You're writing in one place and reading it out the other. Yeah, yeah. DNS, because it's just appendix now. It's always <laughs> going to be faster because SQL like, and the HDF5 is all organized. So when your data has got to change a couple of things, <laughs> to reflect the new organization. So it's never a TD message just right into the end. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, that's Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's, it's never never going to achieve that kind of thing. Yeah. So SQL like is. Slower, that, that's slower, right? Yeah, that, that's it. Yeah, that's what I don't want to make it. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's if you definitely got more complex data, if you've got data bits and relational model really well, um, it's really good. The biggest downside to this, like, well, first is I mean you have to be kind of to be comfortable enough with SQL. Um, I skip that one because I've used it for long enough. I forget that one a bit. Um, the second one is you're basically now committing to write your own viewer application. Uh, <laughs> so TD, you know, all the other formats, there are applications out there that will load and let you view that data without having to write any code, basically. There, um, there is, but not if you want to actually view it as data. 
is that fair? So there's there's like the, the browsers that I've seen, but like if you want to say, right, I want to see this data channel or see this spectrum. Well, you the, say, you say the, the, the SQL yeah, yeah, yeah. Than, yeah, yeah. So you can see this. Yeah, that's more what I mean. Yeah, where something like HDF5, there's a viewer you open and it understands that it's engineering data or whatever in, in, inside. Whereas I think with SQLite, like, you, yeah, you, there are viewers so you can see the structure and then you can query the data and see what's in there. But they're not going to give you a nice graph of, of things that happen. It's possibly. designed for rows rather than arrays. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you can do arrays as rows. <laughs> but sometimes you want to compress them by using some kind of binary format. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's a good point. Yeah, so so it, I was trying to remember actually. I'm so I'm glad you were here. If it had an array type, I think it didn't when I last looked. So you can I think a table, which is actually your array. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can do it as a table, or yeah, I think I've done it where I put a binary. I think for that spectrum project, I put a binary blob in each one. Um, I, the binary. I think the latest version, you had the JSON B binary JSON. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. yeah I've used that already. I think that's only just come out like last month. Ah, okay, yeah, because I know, yeah. I think so, yeah. Just very, very, very nice recently. Yeah. Ah, that, that'll make it more interesting. Then. So, yeah. so JSON B is like a binary representation of JSON data. Um, so it will be faster and, and a bit more compact than, than JSON. I have to say the actual JSON, the text JSON has to be like extremely fast. Yeah, it's, and it's really good. So that's the other thing I like about this um, is, you know, as well as the data, I will create a table called configuration, and I can drop in, you know, either individual configuration items or drop in a JSON blob, you know, JSON um, field of here's all the configuration for the system. Um, so in that spectrum for example, we we're doing, um, yeah, you had like the system configuration, you had the measurement configuration, um, the, the results of the measurements as well as the raw spectrum. So that's where SQLite worked really nicely. You know, we had all separate tables and you could tie it all together as you needed to. So that was my exploration. <laughs> and I still came back to TDMS. But obviously that's a broad generalization. And as I've touched on, I've, I've used most of these in anger at some point. So uh, TDMS isn't the one king to rule them all by any means. And I think what I wanted to give you is a sense of there's an ecosystem around this, and there's, there's decisions to be made based on the performance and the structure of the data that we need. Um, but TDMS is far from aged in any way or anything like that. It's still very high performance. It works really well with modern hardware. I haven't done a test on this, but I think actually TDMS has probably benefited hugely from SSDs um, because certain types of queries through it require quite a bit of random access. Um, I think some of the quirks of the NI's TDMS library are probably optimizations for spinning disks. <laughs> I've not quite worked this out because I've, I've been writing my own library. You know, one of my questions has been, well, what do I take from how NI have done it versus starting the fresh, what do I do differently? And so like, the, it creates like an index file, which I, I, for a while it's been a bit of bee in my bonnet of, I don't see why I needs to do that. <laughs> so I haven't done it, but I can see if you had a, spinning platter disk because it, it, it would be a much faster way to go and access that data, for example, um, and you'd need to keep less data in memory. So there's some interesting artifacts from its age, but I think it's still very relevant and very good for you know, a lot of the type of measurement data that, that we, we work with. Um, it'd be interesting to see if you could ever apply, apply like compression ideas to it, um, although I'm not sure how relevant that would really be for a lot of what we're doing. Um, obviously, for our, you know, compression of CPU versus disk performance and, and, and cost. So, you know, I think that becomes relevant when you want to store it for a long time, you're going to save a lot on disk. Um, but you pay for it, you have to compress it as you write it. You can be less flexible in some of the, the optimizations to disk that it makes, basically. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested to see where you can take the format, because I think it is, yeah, it's a really powerful format. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, the decision I made is, yes, I've started building a Rust library. I'm very pleased with it. It's nearly there. Uh, it's very fast. <laughs> and uh, I will be continuing to use it in a lot of projects. My next kind of project with this now is going, okay, well, how does this, as TMS integrate into the cloud? 
Like, are there any clever things you can do with it with S3, or do you just treat it as a file with S3? And, and, and yeah, I've got a few ideas around that. Whether I'll ever come to get to it, I do not know. <laughs> um, any questions? I realize that's a skim over the top, so if you want me to talk in any more detail on anything I can, or we can talk after. I have a question, like, in Rust. How do you do a UI in Rust? UI in So, I have two routes right now. One is called Towery, which is um, essentially it's like Electron. You get a web view and you build the UI bit, bit in web technologies, and then there's like a communication back and forth. Um, there are a few libraries coming. One of the problems they've had with Rust is historically the way a lot of UI libraries work is very heavily based on inheritance, and Rust doesn't have inheritance. <laughs> so there are ports of things like GTK and Qt, but they don't translate very well into Rust. So I've also done some work. There's a library called eGUI, which for simple stuff is really nice. I don't know how it will work for more complicated stuff. Um, yeah, the web is my like fallback right now on that stuff. The Tauri stuff with a web view, still very lightweight. Um, I can I can do pretty things with that. <laughs> so you you have me exe and you run right? It packages it all up for you. So it's kind of like like Teams is an Electron. Well, actually, no, Teams is now using that same idea. It's not Electron, so it's an exe you run and it uses um, the web view component from the OS. To, to drop in. So it drops that in and then it has an architecture which basically says this is how you talk back and forth to it. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, not so much a question as a comment. Um, it sort of touches on what you said about compression. I uh, worked on some TDMS data maybe two and a half years ago um, and had a sort of a legacy pile of data files that I was trying to write a Python program to do reporting on. Um, and with that, I found it quite beneficial to basically concrete, well, defrag the files. Ah, yes. That's so really I, I, I just wrote some VIs that I think just read a file and then rewrote it. But instead of having many, many segments, I think it basically rewrote it as a single segment. Yes, exactly. And I think I've got about um, the resulting file size was 10% of what it originally was. Yeah. And because I was trying to develop, uh, I was trying, yeah, I had an existing Python script that was reading these files and doing some reporting. Um, and, the, and the thing that sent me down the route of trying to defrag them was simply that I was trying to test them. The, pro, the Python script on, say, five weeks worth of data for like, one of our user cycles. And it was really tedious to sit there watching it churning through all these <laughs> files, but defragging them, as well as the sort of size advantage, it also made the performance of that churning an yeah. awful lot better as well. Yeah, yeah, this is one of the big gotchas of TDMS. A lot of people have this problem because sometimes it's driven by your application as well. So yeah, I, I have an application, it's really slow data. So it's one bit every 10 minutes that crosses loads of channels and it comes in batches. So we have the same problem where, uh, yeah, the, it was probably similar, it's probably the actual data file could be 10% of what was produced because TMS is really fast when if the metadata doesn't change, it can just append to the existing segment. So it becomes really efficient. If you're constantly changing which channels are written, which in LabVIEW also means changing the types of channels. Because the LabVIEW API only lets you write one type at a time. That's one of the things I've got to work out a little bit in mind. Then you're recreating a segment every time, which means you're recreating segment header and metadata every time. And that has two effects. The first is exactly the size. So if this is relatively small compared to this now, the overhead of your metadata versus your actual data becomes significant. Um, and the other is performance, because now if I want to read one channel out, I'm going to have to jump here, 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 you know, all over the file. Um, yeah, so yes, you can... The best data mess is when you're streaming once quickly, yeah. but then you have to defragment it to get better write, read performance. Yes. While something like SD Lite, uh, streaming HDF5, is more doing that for you, because it's slower to write, but it's doing all yeah, that. Yeah. 
Yes, yeah, so like HDF5, you have to pre-allocate, so you can't. You, can. you, you might as extendable. Yeah, but you can only extend to the. I think you can only. You have to mark the bit you're writing as extendable, yeah. and I think you have to then keep extending that before switching to something else. I can't. Yeah, I can't quite remember. I did try and get my head around that. Um, but yeah, you define it essentially. You define it a little bit more from this bit will be extensible. Um, you can, but but exactly that. You know, whereas and SQLite just it's just a whole different model, so it doesn't suffer from the same things. Um, but yeah, so TDMS. So one thing that we did in that particular application, like I had no way to avoid the fragmentation. It was just the way the application produced the data. Um, so in that case, we ran a defrag before we uploaded it. Uh, in this case, it was an IoT thing, so that's why we solved it there. Um, that's another thing I really want to do with the Rust stuff, is actually making like a defrag utility that runs as a command line tool and will hopefully be a lot faster than the, the NI built-in defrag, which is actually quite slow. Um, it's exactly as you said, all it's really doing is read the channels, write it back, but in a more organized fashion. <laughs> um, Yeah, there's there's plenty of pitfalls with writing to TDMS. That's the that's the big downside to it. Uh, uh, I think I might have might probably related because I had a project where it's fairly time crunchy and you know, I needed some high screening performance. Oh, you know, previously worked for like TDMS is the way to go, <laughs> and started running the to it and did not get the speed except. Uh, one thing I might want you probably be able to talk a little bit about is. What is the main difference between the regular TDMS API and the advanced? Yeah. I tried to use the advanced one and failed miserably and just stopped back to regular, <laughs> you know, time crunching. And, yeah. So the, the yeah, so in the NI TDMS library, there is uh, it doesn't call it basic. There is the API, and then there is the advanced API. So the API is very flexible. It's all about flexibility, but it's going to let you do things that cause fragmentation. So it'll, you know, if you write channel one and then you call write to channel two again, it'll look back and say, oh, last time we wrote channel one, so now I need to create a new segment. And that happens in the hood without you seeing it. Basically, what the advanced API drops does, although it doesn't explain it like this, is it drops you down to the segment level. So on the advanced API, the way it works is you say, right, I'm going to write these channels next, and I'm only going to write these channels next. And I think you have to specify the size of each write up front, because basically that's what goes in this metadata bit. <laughs> so what the advanced API basically does is it forces you to write one segment and then only be writing into that one segment. And if you want to do something to force a new segment, you basically have to close that right off and start again. So the advanced API is much faster, primarily because it's not letting you work in a way that's going to cause any fragmentation. It's forcing you to drop down to that level. Um, and that's why it tends to for write. There is actually an advanced read one, but that's a bit weird. I was trying to get my head around that. and Because what I'm trying to do in my Rust library, really, I want to get the same performance as the advanced API, but with one API. That's my one of my goals with that. And so I've kind of been looking at those. Because the advanced read API, again, is you essentially drop into a segment, you say, this is the channel I want to read. So it says, OK, well, this is where the raw data is, and you can just read that out. Yeah. But yeah, it is. So that, that's the basic difference. The advanced API is I will force you down a path that I know will give you good performance. Under the hood, it's doing exactly the same things. Um, but it's just a bit more restrictive. Yeah. I know, I understand everything. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, that, that's kind of been one of my things, is how much can I with a simple, not simple API, with a single API, or how can I guide people to do the right things without it being right? You're either doing advanced or you're doing standard. <laughs> um, it's not trivial, but I have a few ideas. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll grab a coffee. Or how is that time? Lost track a little bit for time. Oh, we'll grab a coffee and we can have a chat, <laughs> have a discussion. <laughs> See how we go.